Welcome. I hope you guys are here for the U.S. Energy and Employment Report 2023 uh, webinar briefing from the NETL Regional Workforce Initiative. Uh, if you are, then you found the right place. Uh, just a couple of, um, you know, infrastructure things to discuss first. Uh, you've been placed on mute as you enter. Um, that's because there's a, going to be about, uh, there was a hundred, about a hundred registered for this uh, event today. So it gets kind of cumbersome with so many people, maybe with their mute off. <laughs> and so, um, the slides and, the uh, the webinar itself will be recorded and will be processed and will be released sometime later on the NETL RWFI website. It takes us a little bit to get that processed. Um, we have a, a very stacked agenda today. Uh, we're going to start off with some brief updates about the Regional Workforce Initiative from Anthony Armley. Then we're going to jump right back into the into the meat of it, uh, a briefing of the 2023 results from the U.S. Energy and Employment Report from Bethany Jones, the Director of U.S. DOE's Office of Energy Jobs. And then with what time we have left, we're going to try to do a little bit of uh, Q&A about regional impacts uh, but also regional and national impacts of the, the data found in the report and how it relates to workforce and economic development in the region. So without further ado, Anthony. Thanks, Matt. Good afternoon, everybody. As Matt said, my name is Anthony Armley. I lead our uh, regional workforce initiative here at the lab uh, based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, so this this regional workforce initiative we we started in 2017, trying to focus on the administration's priorities with upskilling Americans, uh, promoting STEM, and and bringing more awareness to uh, you know to the workforce as far as energy, uh, opportunity energy and jobs opportunities go. Uh, so so we we do that, and and I'll talk about you know how we got to this point, and and you know from when we started in 2017. Next slide. It's it's an extension to the NETL mission. At the end of the day, NETL is trying to get technologies to market. We're taking taxpayer dollars and advancing research, and and so this regional workforce initiative is trying to amplify that effect. And so we're promoting, you know, the workforce opportunities, the economic development opportunities, and focusing on it from the Appalachian region. Um, NETL's three campuses, two of which are located in, in Appalachia, one in Morgantown, West Virginia, the other in Pittsburgh, where I'm located. Uh, there's a lot of re natural resources, obviously, in the ground um, and, and a lot of opportunities for, for as we transition, you know, in energy opportunities, there's a lot of, of new areas that require advanced skills. And so we're trying to bring awareness to that as these new jobs come, come to market. Uh, next slide, please. This just kind of shows the growth that we've had uh, since since inception. You know, we've these numbers obviously were zeroed out. Uh, individual stakeholders were we're well over 800 now. Uh, we we put on these webinars and and we've had over 2,000 plus registrants. That that number is probably closer to 2,500 to 3,000 to be honest with you. I put out a monthly e note. Uh, had a lot of great feedback on that the last couple of years with bringing awareness to new funding opportunities that others may not have known about. Uh, we've got over 300 that subscribe to that monthly. Um, so we're proud of a lot of the, you know, the accomplishments and, and the impact that we've helped our stakeholders in our region with. Next slide. So it's like, how, how did we get those numbers to grow from zero to, to where you just saw? And, and, and to us, it's, it's this consistent engagement with, with the region and, and bringing some sort of output. How do we do that? Uh, we try to put on different webinars for our, for our stakeholders, one of which uh, we call the Energy 101 series. We take a technical topic at the lab and introduce it at a high level. So people that may not work in energy or may not work in research, we want them to come join and learn about what it is that NETL does. Why is it important? What does that mean for the future of these different technologies that we're advancing? Uh, what kind of jobs may come about from some of these advanced technologies? What, what unique skills? Could be needed to support these jobs in the marketplace. So that's a really important uh, series that we put on, and I feel like we've really brought a lot of awareness to the region uh, with not only what NETL does, but just making them aware of why it's important. Another form of of webinars we put on is one that we're you know like we're hosting today, and and it's this U.S. Energy and Employment Report, trying to bring trends 
that we're seeing with energy growth? You know, wh what is it looking like from year to year and then in the future? What are we anticipating the trends being? Um, other things we do, a lot of networking. We go out and visit different uh, employers, universities, technical community colleges. Next week, I'm going and visiting with the United Mine Workers, uh, talking to them about opportunities for collaboration uh, with labor. Um, we host a lot of visitors to the lab. Uh, if you're ever interested and you want to come see NETL, let me know. I'd be happy to host you on a tour. Uh, I mentioned the e-note. We put out this monthly e-note uh, that, that highlights a lot of funding opportunities in the energy space, the science space. Uh, we talk about upcoming events. We amplify uh, events or, or opportunities that, that our stakeholders have and try to help them get awareness to what they're trying to do. Uh, and then we have this, this regional workforce initiative website that we continuously update. We edit, we, we record and edit all of our webinars. We put them up there so that people can go back and see them if they missed it or if there was something they wanted to hear again. Uh, I'll go ahead and put that in the chat right now. Uh, you're, I welcome you to check it out. If you're not subscribed to our e-note, you scroll about halfway down, you can you can click a button there to opt in and it'll 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 add you to our list. Uh, additionally, on our website in the past week, we added a new section, a new link to hydrogen workforce resources. Uh, we'll continue to, to develop that out further, but if you click it now, you'll see uh, there's some really good links to hydrogen. Well, how does hydrogen work? What is hydrogen? Uh, an upcoming event, I believe there's a webinar on some hydrogen stuff, uh, February 16th, I believe it was. Uh, I put the link to that on there. Uh, Matt and I are planning a Hydrogen 101 series uh, later this year. Uh, we will record those. We'll put those on the our Hydrogen uh, resource page there. So again, just trying to trying to bring awareness to, to the hydrogen industry that's that's being built out and uh, sharing of information. That's what we're trying to do here. Next slide. You know, I, uh, our initiative here is I mentioned Appalachian region, so we are focused, but we do have a national reach. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of networking opportunities all over the country, Texas, uh, California, New Mexico, Minnesota, um, really all over. So we do focus on that Appalachian region, but that doesn't limit us um, to our network. Next slide. So I just wanted to give you a quick update here on some some different efforts that, that we've had. And, and if there's one thing I want you to take away from my my update here today, it's that Look, we're trying we're trying to go full full throttle here with new collaborative opportunities. We want to work with people like you. Um, just in the past six to twelve months, I think we've won three or four awards. Um, but we think there's there's more opportunities in the future. A uh, couple I'll highlight here. Uh, <clears throat> recently, we we started working with NREL in Oak Ridge National Lab on a funding opportunity through the Industrial Efficiency Decarbonization Office. Uh, Keep your eyes peeled in the next month or so. Uh, you're going to see a funding opportunity to help uh, manufacturing and, and the energy efficiency of the manufacturing processes. Uh, we're looking for about four to six awards uh, under that. Can't say a whole lot more than that, but uh, something to keep your eyes out um, that we're excited about. Uh, another one that super proud of is uh, this 2023 Technology Commercialization Fund that the Office of DOE's Office of Tech Transitions puts on annually. Uh, we partnered with a few different labs, uh, but also FedTech uh, and, and Brookhaven National Lab is one of the leads there. Basically, we're trying to, to promote the development of technologies and bring in awareness to minority serving institutions. So the five or six labs across the DOE system that are involved, we've put forth a few different technologies that we feel would be a good opportunity, maybe like an internship type summer program uh, where We'll have th these minority serving institute institutions have some of their students that are interested apply, and then they work directly with a researcher from one of these labs uh, for, I think it's nine weeks in the summer uh, to work one on one on developing this technology further. Um, so it's going to bring awareness to these to these MSIs that are crucial for our country and giving these students a, a, a new opportunity, a, a bigger opportunity uh, to develop research. Um, to develop technologies further, but also be aware of these jobs that are out there in the DOE lab system. Uh, so we're super excited about that. That kicks off here uh, shortly, I believe in March. 
uh, that'll be that'll be going out. I think the RFP already went out, so we're actually accepting proposals. Those have to be selected, and then and then the the research, like I said, will start. That internship will start in the summer. Uh, next slide. So next steps, just again, continuing to work with our external partners here to go after proposals, go after new opportunities, collaborative opportunities. Uh, you know, to to move these workforce opportunities along further. Uh, you know. Expanding our, our support of NETL's efforts when it comes to hydrogen. NETL's involved in a handful of different hydrogen hubs uh, with workforce being a part of that, community benefits being a part of that, energy transition, energy justice. Uh, so, you know, we have a lot of capabilities here in those areas. Uh, so if you have any interest, if you have any you want to discuss it further, please feel free to reach out. I'd be happy to talk to you about that. Um, and, and continuing to grow our, our presence with the other, other national labs, which we've done a lot of that in the past year. Next slide. So that's a quick update. Here's my contact information. Uh, appreciate your time today. I'd like to kick it back to Matt uh, so he can introduce Bettany. And uh, looking forward to this US Energy and Employment Report briefing today. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, yeah, those were really great updates um, for the MSI Connect program. Uh, if anybody's interested, the deadline is February 5th for students. And if you have any um, connections with MSI, please send us a note and we will try to send that information out to you quickly. Uh, Bethany, are you ready to go? Uh, maybe I have you on mute. So, sorry. There, I sent you a request. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, it's. Uh, it's great to talk about the US energy employment report. I also want to note right up here at the top that we're actually looking. For a, we have an opening for a new research director in the office of energy jobs, someone to lead. This project uh, year over year. And look at other opportunities to do research and analysis related to energy jobs. So, if anybody on this call is interested or knows somebody that might be interested. Uh, we have a job posting on our website, uh, the office of energy jobs website. I can drop a link in the chat, um, but it's a really exciting. Project, uh, you can advance to the next slide. Uh, we've been doing the US energy employment report since 2016. There was a period of a few years when it was not published by DOE. Um, but in the bipartisan infrastructure law, Congress asked for DOE to resume doing this report. And so, uh, for the foreseeable future, we will be the report. Uh, in the is based on a survey of about 35,000 employers and coupled with BLS data to look at employment in the energy sector, which crosses traditional industry lines, crosses different NAICS codes, which makes it difficult, uh, which is why we, we augment the government data with this additional survey. It covers all 50 states in the District of Columbia, and this year we're adding the US Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. Uh, for the first time, which was also something that Congress asked for. Next slide. So I'm just going to go over a few top lines from the report last year, uh, which the 2023 report covers the data from 2022. So there's a bit of a lag. So in 2022, there were 8.1 million energy jobs, which grew 3.8%, uh, which was faster than uh, the economy generally, where employment grew 3.1%. And we saw that clean energy jobs or jobs in these clean energy technologies associated with uh, decarbonization and a net zero economy increased at a slightly higher rate of 3.9%. And this was before we really started seeing the effects of the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act. It's important to know that there's a bit of a lag between when those bills get adopted and when the investments hit the ground and start creating jobs. Next slide. So we saw that jobs increased across all technology sectors. We look at motor vehicles, uh, both internal combustion engine vehicles and alternative fuel or zero emission vehicles. We saw increases in that uh, technology area. We saw increases in energy efficiency, uh, in fuels, uh, in transmission distribution and energy storage, and in electric power generation. And these 
technology sectors are broken down into more granular technologies, which I'll also cover. Next slide. So a few top lines, I said that clean energy uh, jobs grew 3.9%. Uh, I show in the blue squares here the those sub technology areas that were above average. Um, generally, jobs in clean energy were more than 40% of all the energy jobs increasing by over 100,000. We saw really double digit, you know, in, the, um, in some cases for full EVs and fuel cell vehicles, higher than 20% job growth. Um, and in the, uh, in the battery industry, generally we saw job growth that really outpaced the average. Um, in fact, the job growth in zero emission vehicles was almost as much as the job growth in internal combustion engine vehicles, even though the market share of, uh, of EVs and alternative fuel vehicles is much, much smaller. So that's just an indicator of very, very rapid growth in that space. And I'll illuminate uh, some specifics on that in some future slides. We also saw above average percent growth in wind and solar and geothermal and in pumped storage and hydropower. So, um, those were some of the technologies that were really driving uh, driving that growth. I, I just I realized I just misspoke. The solar job growth wasn't above average in terms of percent, but we did see a lot a high number of jobs in solar, and it was about average growth. Next slide. So I was talking about battery uh, EVs. We saw nearly as many jobs in the EV space as uh, we saw in the gas and diesel vehicle space. Um, 28,400 jobs in the EV zero emission vehicles and compared to 31,000 for uh, um, the gas, uh, gas and diesel vehicles. And we saw really rapid uh, job growth in the hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Um, but again, that's such a small industry that the numbers were much smaller. Um, but you can see the uh, the increases on the on the chart here that just shows those uh, those zero emission vehicles really uh, really adding a lot of jobs. We had to put the gas and diesel vehicles on a different scale uh, because there's so many more. But the to see that the the increase was the same that's the really remarkable thing. Uh, with this data. Next slide. The energy uh, and employment report also looks at demographics in the energy sector, and it's a goal to try to make the energy employment more inclusive and representative of the U.S. population. It's it's not. Um, in particular, women are very underrepresented in energy. Uh, 26% of energy jobs are held by women compared to 40% of jobs in the overall economy. So, and, you know, roughly half of the, the population. So um, that's an area for of increasing opportunity, especially as we're seeing growing demand for workers. We really need to figure out how to make these jobs more inclusive and accessible to workers who are underrepresented. Um, we saw a lot of progress for female participation last year. Um, in fact, the the percent went from 25 to 26 percent. Basically, half of the net new jobs added were held by women. And I thought that was really un almost unbelievably remarkable when I heard it. And then I realized that that's more or less what it would need to be um, for, for real gender parity in the industry. So last year we were very much on track and we just want to make sure that we maintain uh, that pace. Um, for non-white energy workers, the energy sector is slightly higher representation, but black and African-American workers are underrepresented and that's true across every technology area. The energy sector does a good job at hiring veterans. Um, we have 9% veterans in the energy sector compared to 5% in the workforce. We are not 
doing as well in terms of creating opportunities for formerly incarcerated workers. Um, and again, as we are trying to make the energy workforce more representative, that's something that we really need to address, uh, just given the statistics of black and African American men who uh, have an experience with the criminal justice system. We really need to make sure that we're creating opportunities for for those um, those workers if we want to move the needle on uh, African American and black representation in the energy workforce. And then on a high note, the energy workforce is younger than the US average. Um, and so that's encouraging. We hear a lot about the silver tsunami or a lot of uh, an aging workforce. That's true in the energy sector, but it's actually less a concern than in the economy more generally. Um, one of the statistics that we saw looking at the data last year is that unionized employers were much more likely, more than twice as likely to require diversity or inclusion programs or have specific plans and strategies to increase hiring of women, racial and ethnic minorities and LGBTQ workers. So we saw 46% of unionized firms had formal policies and plans compared to 22% of non-union firms. This isn't to say there's not still work to do. It's just we want to recognize where uh, where there's progress and where there's attention. Next slide. Okay, so one of the things that we looked at last year that we hadn't actually looked at in previous years was whether there was a difference between union and non-union firms in terms of difficulty hiring. And in fact, we saw really, really stark differences where unionized firms report much lower difficulty hiring than non-unionized firms. And this was particularly true in the construction industry where less than a third of union employers said it was very difficult to find the skilled workers that they needed. Whereas almost two thirds of non-union employers said it was very difficult. We attribute this to the investments that unionized firms make in registered apprenticeship and continually building the pipeline of skilled workers. We see that in the results, they then have a much easier time recruiting the, the workers that they need. And nearly a quarter of unionized firms say it's not difficult at all to find the skilled workers they need. This is interesting because unemployment is very low. The labor market is very tight. We hear a lot about the labor shortages and difficulty finding qualified workers. And it's very, very interesting to see that unionized firms that are offering those higher wages and benefits and also investing in workforce education and training are not reporting the same level of difficulty. Next slide. Um, so again, just to recap the energy sector jobs grew 3.8 percent between 2021 and 2022, outpacing the growth of U.S. employment overall. We're still recovering from the pandemic. Um, we've recovered nearly 600,000 of the 840,000 jobs lost between 2019 and 2020. Uh, again, about 40% of the jobs were in clean energy. What we're defining as clean energy are those technologies that are aligned with a net zero future. Um, so it's uh, it's clean energy, it's renewable energy jobs, nuclear, carbon capture, direct air capture, all of the a, a lot of the technologies that we're currently investing in through the bipartisan infrastructure law and inflation reduction act. Um, mining and extraction saw the largest increase in jobs, uh, and um, while we don't really look at causality in this report, it was fairly clear that the uh, Russian invasion of the Ukraine and that conflict uh, resulted in high, higher than anticipated exports of petroleum and wet gas, leading to increases in jobs in those technology areas. Next slide. So drilling down a little bit and some highlights by state, West Virginia saw the fastest growth in energy jobs, 17.4%, which was really driven by that growth in fuels. Uh, Texas had the most energy jobs, uh, surpassing California with nearly a million uh, energy jobs, really driven by, again, an increase in fuels, uh, very high addition of motor vehicle jobs, 
second only to California, and they saw the highest growth in electricity jobs. Total jobs increased in all 50 states, total energy jobs. There were some declines in individual technologies, um, but, uh, but by state, uh, we saw job growth in, across all 50 states. The largest decrease uh, was in, in motor vehicles was in Alaska by percent, and the largest uh, decrease in terms of number of jobs was in Indiana, also in motor vehicles. And that's just more data pointing to this, this transition that is already underway in the motor vehicle space uh, between the internal combustion engine and the growing EV and zero emission vehicle uh, uh, technologies. Next slide. So we wanted to look at some highlights uh, for the regional workforce initiative area. And we, uh, we came up with these bullets. So West Virginia had the second highest growth rate in fuels uh, nationally of any state, which was really driven by coal fuel. And coal electric power generation declined in the state. So this increase was likely driven by coal exports. Uh, Ohio had the fourth highest growth rate in battery electric vehicles, a 24% increase in jobs there. And Pennsylvania also saw growth in the battery electric vehicle space of 16%. These are really much higher. Again, the U.S. average employment growth rate was 3.1%. So these are much, much higher, although the numbers are still small. Uh, hydropower jobs in Pennsylvania increased Again, way above average, 8.4%, which was the 12th uh, highest in the nation. Next slide. Uh, additional, additional bullets. Uh, Pennsylvania added the second highest number of trans, uh, transmission and distribution jobs following West Virginia. Jobs in all major technology groups grew in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and West Virginia, except for uh, two exceptions. Electric power generation declined in Ohio by a few hundred jobs, and motor vehicles declined in West Virginia by 60, about 60 jobs. Battery electric vehicles were the source of the most jobs added in Ohio, over 1,200. And traditional transmission and distribution was the source of the most jobs added in West Virginia and Pennsylvania, 6,600 6, and 4,100 respectively. Next slide. So we went over this. This is just a, a bit more of the data showing the energy workforce demographics. A couple of things that I didn't highlight with, with uh, numbers above is American Indian and Native uh, Alaskan uh, individuals make up 2% of the energy workforce, which is double the U.S. average. Again, Black and African American workers are up underrepresented across every technology area. Um, I said that the energy workforce is younger than average. Uh, only 17% of the energy workforce is older than 55, compared to nearly a quarter of the national workforce. And uh, unionization rates are higher in the energy sector than the private sector average across the technologies. We see 11% unionization compared to 7% private sector average. This is higher in certain technologies like utilities and nuclear energy and lower in some of the, um, some of the other technologies like, um, like some of the renewable energy, it's still lower. Next slide. So drilling down a little bit on a few technology areas uh, to start with, we'll look at electricity. Uh, every sub every technology under the transmission distribution and storage technology sector gained jobs. Traditional transmission added the most jobs uh, over 17,000 and grid modernization. Uh, grew a lot, actually, only a little over 2,000 jobs, but 11.6% growth. Um, in this sector, 18% of workers are covered by a union agreement, 
And uh, this sector, transmission, distribution, and storage, is also more racially diverse than the energy sector uh, workforce average. Uh, the energy technologies um, and efficiency, uh, the TDS technologies that enable efficiency in renewables uh, grew at slightly above average 5,100 jobs. And battery manufacturing represented 15% of all the storage jobs, which was a slight increase from 2021. Uh, and electric power generation, clean electric power generation added uh, over 22,000 jobs. Um, and uh, electric solar generation had the most gains in terms of the numbers, over 12,000 jobs. But uh, advanced natural gas electric power generation grew the most as a percent with really uh, almost double uh, the growth rate of, of average 7.7%. And the only technology in this sector where the workforce decreased was coal, uh, which shed over 6,000 jobs, uh, reducing the workforce in that sector by 9.6%. Next slide. Uh, again, the, there's some significant trends in motor vehicles. Vehicle jobs grew almost 65,000 jobs last year, which is below average in terms of a percent wise, just 2.5%. Uh, but electric vehicle jobs grew uh, almost 27%, adding again 28,000 new jobs. Hydrogen and fuel cell vehicles increased also a lot by percent, not huge numbers of jobs, but uh, really rapid growth. And the same with plug-in vehicles and hybrid vehicles. Next slide. Uh, I'm looking at fuels, petroleum had the biggest gains, adding nearly uh, over 58,000 jobs, 12.5% growth, uh, which follows a loss of petroleum jobs in 2021. Natural gas gained over 51,000 jobs, coal, uh, over 11,000 jobs, and the largest number of uh, fuels employees were in the extraction industry, uh, adding over 107,000 jobs. Again, we think that the situation the Ukraine had was something uh, that might have been driving this. Zero emission and lower carbon technologies uh, added jobs as well, but, but much lower and, and at a below average percent growth. Next slide. So this shows, you have to sort of stare at this slide a little, so it might make more sense to do that uh, outside of this presentation, but this shows that across the five technology areas that we look at, how the jobs break down by those traditional uh, industries, NAICS code industries. And so you can see in the, um, in the motor vehicle space, the uh, the manufacturing jobs represent a good chunk of that, um, and then wholesale trade distribution and transport um, represent another big chunk. Whereas in energy efficiency, a lot of the jobs are in construction. Uh, in electric power generation, a lot of the jobs are in construction. Same with transmission, distribution, and storage. So you can see how different traditional industry areas that the way that normal government data is organized uh, crosswalk with these technology areas. Next slide. Uh, fuels uh, reverse declines. Again, we think that uh, there's a few reasons for this, the situation in Ukraine and also just um, extraction catching up with post-COVID increases of demand. So we saw a lot of decreased demand for fuels during the COVID period. And some of that, this is just catching up to, uh, to pre-COVID levels. So we saw a lot of growth in fuels. Next slide. And yeah, and that's it. And I'm happy to answer questions. Great, uh, that was, very interesting, especially stuff about West Virginia and Pennsylvania. Um, I think we have a bit of time. Um, so I think maybe let's see if we have any questions that are immediately 
Um, yes, there will be, uh, this presentation is being recorded. Uh, it takes some time for us to process the recording and get the final drafts of the presentations into presentation form, but they will be available on our website uh, at some point in the next week or so, hopefully shorter. Um, so from Zach Johnson, if we have a plan, white paper to increase representation for women, blacks, natives, homeless, and formerly incarcerated persons, who would be a good point of contact within the DOE? I'm sorry, Bethany, I, I put you on mute again. That was my bad. <laughs> That's okay. I would love to see that white paper uh, where we have a 21st century energy workforce advisory board made up of 14 thought leaders and experts from around the country. And they're working on recommendations, uh, things that the Department of Energy can do to support 21st century workforce that includes uh, building a diverse and inclusive and skilled workforce. And so I think that that analysis could be really useful uh, in that process. So we can, if I can figure out how to drop my email in the chat, but I would love to see that work. So, um, I don't know if you'll remember this slide particularly, but slide 16, why are blacks underrepresented? I don't know which sector that would, would have been in. Can we, um, yeah, we don't, uh, we don't try to guess the whys for any of this data. Um, but there's a lot of research on, uh, on why blacks, black workers are underrepresented and. A lot of industries, background checks, uh, employer background checks are a huge barrier um, and get in the way of those second chance opportunities. Um, so we know that that's a pretty widely used practice in the energy sector. Um, there's uh, the high rates of incarceration of black men uh, during prime working years. So. That's a huge opportunity. I mean, there's a huge opportunity to create opportunities for formerly incarcerated workers. Um, and there's some really great example workforce programs across the country that are doing that and doing that really effectively. Um, and then there's the, you know, just the systemic patterns of racial discrimination uh, in the workplace that I'm sure contribute to that as well. So, uh, just a general announcement: we we don't have the ability to to uh, annotate the presentation. So, if you'd like to point out something in the chat, we could definitely get to your question. Uh, so, uh, how does this report uh, differ? I'm I'm guessing it's differ from the one below, or is it the same? The U.S. Energy Report 2023. It's it's this it's the same, I believe. The U.S. Energy and Employment Report 2023 is the full report that's being briefed on today. So I think that can be found on the DOE website. Yep. Slide 14, how many percent jobs increase in advanced degrees versus blue collar jobs? That's an important kind of question. Indeed, just a general question is, I think we had done our own analysis in the oil and natural gas sector and had found cursorily that a number of the technologies that, or the number, a number of the occupations that you would associate with oil and natural gas were increasingly becoming, uh, the skills necessary for them were becoming higher. And indeed, in our small analysis data set, we found that a lot of these occupations were starting to in include uh, skills like data uh, analysis or coding. So I guess speaking on general trends, what do you feel about the the move to higher skills, even in occupations that have already been, you know, pretty much established in the energy sector? It, yeah, you know, I think that if we look at the data, the analyses that have been done on the employment effects of the bipartisan infrastructure law and Inflation Reduction Act, we're still going to see a lot. The majority of jobs in the energy sector. Uh, in the in the coming years are going to be in the construction industry. There's so much build out, uh, so many investments in infrastructure um, that I think a lot of the job growth is is going to be in traditional uh, construction occupations, which are not low skill. Um, 
So a lot of these uh, skilled trades require, you know, three to five year apprenticeship training uh, leading to uh, the equivalent of a bachelor's or master's degree. If you're a, a journeyman electrician, having graduated a five year uh, apprenticeship program, that's, you know, that's not a low skill occupation. Um, there is a, a need for learning new tasks, learning these new technologies. Of course, there's, um, you know, uh, cybersecurity issues. There's AI that is in really rapidly penetrating a lot of new industries, and we don't really know how that's going to be incorporated. So there is going to be a need for higher skills. I think the bifurcation between what jobs you need a four-year degree for and what you don't need a four-year degree for, we need to think about that a little bit um, more creatively. Uh, so, for example, if we think about engineers, well, we usually think about that as a, as a job that you need to go to college and potentially graduate school for, whereas in other countries, uh, the UK, Germany, for, as two examples, uh, there's engineering apprenticeships where you can uh, earn, earn and learn, uh, where you get a job, where you're uh, paired with a mentor, um, but and you're also attending classroom training. And this is a three to six year uh, program where you're, you don't have to take time out of work to go pay exorbitant college tuition and wait and try to get a bachelor's degree and then get a job where you're combining those two things from the start. I think we could blur the lines a bit between where you need an advanced degree and where there might be other training pathways to support the, the pipeline of workers and, and make some of these educational opportunities more accessible uh, to a more inclusive and diverse workforce. So, even as the skill requirements increase, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that we need to funnel everyone to the traditional pathways of higher education. So, uh, I believe you stated higher diversity in the transmission sector. Does that data indicate a reason diversity is higher there than in other sectors? Um, again, we don't, you know, we take great pains not to try to get into the whys of this report. It would uh, would get in the way of our goal of publishing it annually. But I think the utility sector just has a lot of uh, a lot of experience in this space and has done a lot of work on building those workforce pipelines on reaching out to members of the communities that they serve. You know, I think there's been a lot of intention uh, in that sector. So, uh, the report's been going on for a couple of years now. Um, can you speak to uh, one of the things that's it's it's never really had a lot of is workforce data or you know skills or educational requirements or uh, do you think uh, future reports may have some of that or do you think it's valuable as as it continues on or do you, do you think for presenting you know uh, census is essentially like it jobs data is the, is the most important element. I think that this report uh, fills a hole in other that exists from other government data sources um, and that providing this job breakdown by technology, you can actually crosswalk it to where the um, what the occupations are and then what the training pathways for those occupations are. I don't think that there's, uh, you know, this report is primarily based on a survey that then augments existing data sets. So to do additional analysis for on workforce issues is possible with the data that's provided, but I don't think it's going to be incorporated into the survey or into the analysis that uh, that DOE does just to publish this report. I think we, I think there's real value in putting this data out and putting this data out annually and consistently. And then this provides data that a lot of other analysis, maybe some of that would be done by DOE. Some of that could also be done by third parties uh, can build on to look at some of those questions. Yeah, I think being, I, I was part of the very first user report. And I think being at the very beginning, the, the main, I guess, 
the main problem was that there was not a sufficient method of, you know, capturing the energy sector as a whole using the, the BLS, you know, data as, as is, especially with the emerging technologies. And it seems like we're going to have even more emerging technologies, energy technologies like hydrogen, direct air capture, other carbon capture uh, technologies. So I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a useful tool. That had been I think the other thing to add here is that UCR is, is backward looking. And I think right. some of the workforce questions, at least the workforce questions that we're uh, trying to answer are forward looking. What are the, where are jobs going? What are the, for, what's the projection? What are the, what is the demand for workers look like? What are the um, training needs uh, and gaps that need to be filled? So I think we are looking at and trying to answer workforce questions, but it's more in order to help uh, guide workforce development investments and figure out where are there really acute gaps between demand and supply that need filling, whether that's um, particular occupations or particular training needs or upskilling or, or what have you. So it's really trying to answer those questions in a way to support planning. Whereas the UCR report, like I said, is backward looking. It might indicate some trends if you look at year over year changes, but it's not particularly helpful as a forecast. I'm gonna to try to combine a couple of questions here. Um, but can you discuss the granularity of the user data and how regions can draw lessons on their workforce needs? And I think an uh, offshoot of that would be, um, what are some ways that other people can get involved in, you know, utilizing the data and like uh, drop getting like uh, data from the report and using it for their own analyses? Yeah, so the first part of that question is a good one. We have at the national level, we have the ability to, we get more granular insights on technologies and sub sub technologies, whereas at the state level, we don't have the granularity to be able to offer very, like to get that specific in terms of technologies. So there, the data gets aggregated slightly differently. That makes it difficult. Last year, we were trying to say something clear about clean energy jobs, which we hadn't done before because it's the, those different aggregation schemes make it really difficult. So the number of clean energy jobs that we can report nationally is based on different different level of granular data than what we have at the state level. And so clean energy jobs at the state level have to use slightly different definitions than clean energy jobs at the national level. and. And that's because we don't have the statistical significance to report that level of the same level of granularity at the state level. Um, and that's constrained by, you know, by the survey, but also by the BLS data and how they aggregate. Um, how can this be used? I, I don't know. I mean, I think there's, I think, you know, some organizations build on it and do more, um, provide some of that more granular analysis at the state level. I think looking at trends over time can be useful. I think it's important for states or organizations that are thinking about workforce development to calibrate, to use this data, to calibrate training investments and training programs with the, the real existing jobs. Um, it's always a problem problematic when we, get really enthusiastic about particular uh, technologies and their growth and then overtrain people and the jobs don't manifest. So I think this can be a way to sort of level set and look at what the what the actual trends are. Um, and, you know, I think it's valuable to provide consistent data year over year uh, so that organizations uh, know what they can anticipate and think of other ways to use it that, that DOE might not ever have thought of. So, uh, are there any DOL approved apprenticeship programs specific to clean or alternative energy that you know of at the Advanced Career and Technical Education Convention? They stated there was not one as now, but we would love to help create those pathways. Uh, DOE apprenticeship programs for what? 
DOL, Department of Labor. Oh, DOL apprenticeship programs. Yeah, actually DOL, uh, there was a push for a long time to get a solar installer apprenticeship program. DOL did rule last year that they wouldn't be doing that because uh, the tasks associated with solar installation fall under the tasks related to uh, electrical training, electrician yeah. training. And so they don't parse out a smaller subset of tasks to create new occupations and new apprenticeship programs. We are looking at, um, through our battery workforce initiative, we've been mapping the skill requirements needed for battery manufacturing and that supply chain um, and trying to develop training guidelines to support new registered apprenticeships in that space. Um, so that's ongoing work looking at how can we expand this really incredible tool of registered apprenticeship programs to support workforce pathways for some of these emerging uh, and rapidly growing industries in the US. So we are going to close out questions here with one last one. Uh, I know it's been a, a, a little bit longer of a session than we usually have. So <laughs> I want to give the speaker some time to like recuperate from speaking. <laughs> And um, and also, Anthony, we'll queue you up after this question uh, to give some, uh, if you have some questions or some final words, and then we'll pass it back to our presenter for final words as well to anything that she's excited about um, or interested in pursuing um, in, with this project. All right, so are you tracking efforts to accelerate the ramp up of more small businesses in this space? I guess is that a question small, for me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I oh. think yeah. It's a small business enterprises and stuff. Like I don't know if the the data captures that's that not um that's not specifically a jobs question. I mean yes. some people think about these two things together, workforce development and small business or you know, business growth. The um another office at DOE uh might be tracking that, but that's not part of the jobs analysis. So this was great. Anthony, do you have any uh, final words or, or discussion points? I do. I, first of all, I just want to give a special thanks to Bethany for her contributions. This was great. A uh, ton of good information. I always, I always appreciate this, this briefing every year. Um, and then thank you to, to you all for joining us today. A lot of good questions, a lot of good participation in the chat. And uh, that's what makes it a good, in my opinion, a good webinar is when you have good interaction and uh, today was great. So I, I, I definitely appreciate you all. Yeah, likewise, thank you all for joining and for the very thoughtful questions. Uh, we're, we're excited to do this forecast for the first time as sort of a companion to the backward looking use year. And so the 2024 US Energy and Employment Report is likely to come out again in June. Um, and then this future looking uh, forecast, looking particularly at the workforce gaps uh, will follow on the heels of that. And uh, so look forward to your continuing engagement with this research. Thank you. All right, you. With, with that, we'll close it out. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for all your great questions. Again, if you need uh, a, a copy of this or the recording, it will be up in hopefully in the next week on the RWFI website. Thanks again. Have a great afternoon. Goodbye.